Welcome to Living Not So Fabulously, the podcast where we pull back the curtain on money stories from your favorite activists and allies, artists and tech gurus, and trailblazing leaders in the LGBTQ community. We are David and John Otten Schneider, your financial coaches and hosts. Having experienced firsthand what it's like coming back from debt, we want to help you avoid our mistakes to build the life that you want. So we all can live just a little bit more fabulously. And now for the show. Welcome to Living Not So Fabulously. Today's guest is Patrick Riley, an award-winning journalist, multimedia personality, and author known for his work on BET, NBC, Black News Channel, and TV One. Patrick spent 13 years as a freelance and senior producer for the show you might not have heard of, <laughs> Oprah Winfrey Show, and is the author of That's What Friends Are For, on the women who inspired me. And maybe most importantly, he's our friend. Yeah, and we're gonna be talking to Patrick in our interview today a little bit about emergency and emergency protections, um, which reminds me a little bit of a story about being prepared for emergencies. <laughs> this one takes me way back. David was a wee lad. <laughs> All the way back to when I was 19. I was headed to the bank with my mom because both I and my parents had been saving so that I could take a post-graduation trip. And we were there at the bank so that my mom could co-sign it on a credit card for me. And she looked at me very specifically and she said, David, this is for emergencies only, <laughs> right? But... <laughs> well, I never saw the back of an ambulance or a police car but I evidently had quite a bit of fun because I came back with a max out credit card. And? <laughs> and that debt stuck with me for 17 years until I finally paid it all off. What I think is so interesting about your story is how it mirrors the findings from our studies with The Motley Fool right. in that LGBTQ plus folks tend to have more debt, more types of debt other than mortgage debt, of course, and that a top concern of those 4,000 some respondents was having enough money to cover an emergency. Yeah, so let's dive into the first part of our interview with Patrick, where we talk with him about how his emergency protections protected him, and then, well, they kind of didn't. So let's get into the interview. Welcome, Patrick. We are super excited to have you. I am super <laughs> excited to be before you. I know we met in 2017, yes. and I love that everywhere you go, you invite me back. I guess I'm one of your favorites. Yes. I, I heard it yes. in the intro. Yep, definitely. <laughs> yes. You tell a really good, compelling story, and that's yeah. that's why we like to have you back. Yeah. You were a guest on the Queer Money Podcast, and we love that. And we've had a lot of experiences together, but unfortunately, you had a recent experience. Well, maybe not so recent, but... Maybe you could tell our, our listeners and viewers about this experience. Well, let me tell you, November 2021, I woke up to an electric fire coming out of my kitchen, and I had just enough time as I looked back at the fire. I, I, I attempted to, to, to do something to try to rescue it or me, but the best thing I could do was walk out. Mm -hmm. And so I lived in a, live in a co-op. This is a one-bedroom unit, uh, completely destroyed. Yeah, And I lost it all. And what was ironic about it is it happened inside pandemic. I mentioned November 21. Right. Yeah. And so uh, there were a lot of pivots going on with me at that time. And um, it has been a nightmare to get to this side of things. I'm two and a half years um, displaced and I've just gotten back into my place like within the last week to two. Wow. Wow. So I'm sure there's a ton to unpack there. Can you tell me a little bit like what did you smell smoke? Did you hear the fire, the, the smoke alarms? What was going on? <laughs> Do you know what it was? I uh, had uh, fallen asleep on my couch in my living room and I observed the lamp go out. Mm -hmm. It's just sort of like the light go out. So I'm thinking I'll change the bulb tomorrow, mm -hmm. not knowing that it was connected to this fire that had started out of the kitchen right. and that was coming into the living room. So it was literally coming to me. Had I not awakened at that moment, um, I would have been in the fire. Oh, wow. And I didn't have a chance to grab anything. Um, so I ran out in my underwear and uh, did, I don't even think I had shoes on. Oh, wow. it, it was a real desperate yeah. Desperate moment. Yeah. yeah. That sounds very scary. I, th I think a lot of us think about these ideas. You know, we've been trained from, from little, as little kids, touch the door to see if it's hot so you don't open the door. You know, we have all these stories yes. in our heads yes. of what it would be like to have that happen. But then it happens to you. And I'm sure that was probably just a very, uh, a, a very 
jarring moment for you? It was instantly overwhelming. It was instantly uh, paralyzing. Uh, there was shame. There was embarrassment because um, by this time in lockdown, you know, we were in pandemic at that time. Right. Um, I had adjusted a lot of my work to be virtual. Mm. So the idea that I'm working virtually and I now don't have a home to work in yeah. put a lot of stress on me. No doubt. Um, I was, I, I had home insurance, but I had let it lapse. Mm. This happened inside this very window. Um, ultimately, I was able to figure some things out, but what I had to call on or lean on, uh, the first thing I leaned on, my loved ones. Yeah. Um, in a different way, because I'm usually Patrick, the provider, Patrick, the 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 one the one with access to Oprah. I heard you dropping that name earlier. <laughs> and so it was a, a different um, gaze for me to be in need, to yeah. be vulnerable, to not have the answers figured out. Right. A lot of that savings that I had that might have helped me breathe a little bit better had already been spent because we'd already been in pandemic for uh, a year. Right. Yeah. And I had lost a lot of the revenue I was going to get from what was a second leg of the book tour all canceled because of uh, pandemic. Geez. Yeah. So these were all the things going through my mind at that time. What do I do? How do I do it? And then when we got to the insurance piece, it was uh, I could get one check straight up that would sort of handle everything and then I would do it on my own mm -hmm. or I could um, do it myself, fund the rebuild myself and then get a check on the back end. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and so that is what I did. I um, used the, the GoFundMe pot and my income, what I was raising, to work with a contractor of choice mm -hmm. who was willing to work with me pace by pace by pace to get this place rebuilt. And that way I could afford it. It wasn't as gargantuan uh, a, a, a trauma in this regard. Right. And then um, I would get a settlement check. And that settlement check, I, I'm happy to report, only just arrived this week. So wow. now I'm able to fulfill payment to vendors, contractor, and kind of on a clean sweep, begin the work of, of of living in my home anew. Nice. So let's dive into that a little bit. So, so you're, you are, you, you, you've set up this life. You've been doing everything right. You had your emergency savings. You've, you've got these multiple sources of income coming in. Then the pandemic happens and that yes. dries up your emergency savings as it did for a lot of folks. Um, and then the last line of resource was supposed to be the insurance. But what what happened with the insurance? The insurance exactly it, it lapsed, or you weren't? It wasn't fully paid in. Yeah, uh, the insurance had lapsed, but fortunately, because of the nature of the fire, the co-op had the coverage. Uh, so I was covered over my coverage. Mm. You were covered over. And your coverage. that is what I brought. Yeah, with the co-op, with mm. the association, and so that became the coverage that I knew I could count on. Mm -hmm. And that is what I then brokered to finally get to this point where I did get financial assistance to be able to rebuild and move back in my place. But it, it but, but again, that was something I didn't know. Right. I had my, fa my father, I just lost my father in November, but he Sorry. was always my financial advisor. So my dad said, one, if this is the situation you're in, mm -hmm. you go to the co-op and explain to them that you have awareness of how these things work. I didn't have that awareness. He told me yeah. there's money there to take care of this. Right. Um, when they offered me what they offered me, it wasn't, um, it, it, it didn't uh, structure itself in a way that I could still handle it. They still wanted maybe 60000 off the top to be able to move forward with their choice of contractor, et cetera. Yeah. And I said, mm. I went through each line and realized, because my dad said, don't take anything they they offer you up front. Make sure you bring it back home, peruse it. So I perused line by line what they were charging me to do, you know, the, the walls, the floors, all of those kinds of things. So let's take a pause on the interview for a second because, wow. Yeah, that's, that's a lot. It's, it's one of those situations that you think is never gonna happen to you until it does. Yeah. Unfortunately, Patrick had some protections, right? right. He could lean into the insurance that his co-op had as well as he could lean into his friends and family, maybe most importantly. Yeah, very nice. So we'll be right back.
thanks for sticking with us through that quick break. What I think is great about Patrick's story is that it really highlights that having just a little bit of money in emergency savings is empowering because basically what it does is it gives you a lot of options. Yeah, we actually were faced with that option one time. Here we were, John and I driving home from work, la-di-da, and all of a sudden, bam. No, we didn't get into an accident. We actually hit a huge pothole. And, or Dita, or um, little Mini Cooper. Right. <laughs> so we make it to a tire shop and we find out that not only did we have a tire that needed to be replaced, but we had a rim that needed to be replaced because it got bent. So our choice was, were we going to submit a claim to our insurance, pay the $500 deductible, take the $300 from them, but continue to have to pay increased premiums, or we were gonna pay that eight to $900 ourselves. So well, fortunately, we had the money in our emergency savings so we could take the time to ask ourselves, which would be better for us, not just in the short term, but in the long term. So we ended up paying for it ourselves. And then going out for martinis after that. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I think what's important here is, you know, we definitely want to shoot for everybody to have anywhere from three to six months worth of living expenses. That's the standard recommendation to cover an emergency. Right. But unfortunately for LGBTQ plus folks, our advice is to maybe lean into having six to 12 months, as hard as that may be, because we face as a community much more adversity, right? It's easier for us to lose a job. Yeah. And we have other headwinds that we're facing, especially right now, that having that extra cushion that the general population doesn't necessarily need to have is probably a good thing. Yeah. So with that, we we're gonna to return to the second part of Patrick's interview where he advocates for more of us having more in emergency savings. I think a key takeaway there financially is what your father said, that make sure you go line by line and don't just take everything that they give you. Something I'm not clear on, so that was the co-op insurance. Yes. Um, so you, at least you had some coverage, but were, were you supposed to have your own homeowners or renters insurance? Oh, I was supposed to, and, I, and, and it what, had that is what had lapsed inside the pandemic. Right. So that I'd hit a mark having pushed through those savings where some I had to sort of make those decisions. Do I not pay this this month? Do I not pay? So this fire, you know, when you when you think I'd be I'm okay not to pay this this month, I'll double it up next month. All of all that that looks like. Yeah. Yeah. The fire happened as I I joke with my pants down literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so that could have been the end of the road for me yeah. had I not loving advisors around me to tell me, uh, okay, th that didn't work, yeah. then let's go here. Now, now I'm fully insured. Right. I'm insured on the insurance. Okay. <laughs> like it's a whole thing. Right. Thank you, Allstate. I love you. And was the lapse because of like one mispayment or? It was two. I, I was, I was on the, I was within the two yeah. months okay. of lapse. Right. Okay. Whereas I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to catch up, figure this out when right. that next check comes in. You know, we're working a little not regularly because we're in a pandemic. You know. All of those things were on the table yeah. at the point where this happened. Right. You know. And in hindsight, would you, if you had to do it over again, would you have chosen to not pay something else instead? Oh, and if well, so, what, that, what would that have been? Hindsight, absolutely. I would have, um, well, I just have a different respect for home insurance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know, um, a respect I don't think I ever had because I never had to file anything for anything yeah. over these many years. I've owned since um, 2000. Yeah. So this was a, a slap me in the face moment of, oh, that's why you don't lapse on your payments. Right. Yeah. Like, like you, that's my let that's my takeaway. Right. Yeah. yeah, I totally get I think a lot of people would probably made the same decision that you did. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately the consequences were dire. Yeah, again, we've we I, we all make mistakes sometimes. Sometimes the mistakes are ones that we're able to easily get over and sometimes they're a lot more difficult. It's yeah. not even like a mistake. It's kind of just like you had to you had to pick your options. Yeah. Right? Well it was survival. Right. Survival the whole right. idea of um it could get worse, you know, everything that was kind of going on just based on a pandemic, lockdown, adjustments, pivots, it was already a dark time for me. Right. Yeah. And so when this happened, it was one of those, but wait, there's more? Are you kidding me? Yeah. yeah. I, I I don't but for the 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 advisement, the the sound advisement. From my dad, who I was embarrassed to even call and let him know that this had happened. I think it happened. I called the next day. Mm. Like You were embarrassed to let him know the fire happened or the insurance happened? All of lapsed. the above. Mm. Because I'm his responsible son. Yeah. I'm the <laughs> one who kind of gets it right. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm the one that if I do borrow, I'm paying it back on time, if not early. Yeah, yeah. That's, that, that's the myth of me. Yeah. 
But the reality of me is uh, it didn't all work out as I had planned and I needed support and I needed to lean on that support as if I was a little toddler because this was a whole realm that I knew nothing about. Speak again to that idea of having to wait. I think a lot of people, when we have insurance, um, we ought to just automatically assume we call up the, the insurance agency and the agent and we tell them what happened and, yes. you know, we're getting a check the next day. That's where the commercials presented. Anyway. Right. Exactly. Well, but, once I got the clarity of that this money would be available to support me and that we were going to do it my way, mm -hmm. which was to work with my contractor of choice up to the point at which they would uh, uh, consider this settlement, I... Um, I knew it was going to take a long time. Yeah. And uh, I guess there's one more piece of testimonial in here because I sort of had that part figured out. Um, the GoFundMe did what it did to more so help me with um, uh, the, the remediation piece. So it really had less to do with the rebuild as much as it kind of got me back to ground one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but then back to relationships and friends. I had great friends who knew I needed to get my toe back in TV. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And I had a great friend who, the same friend who brought me on to Oprah in the late 90s, um, brought me on to do the producing I'm doing now. I produce um, deal segments for CBS Saturday Morning and CBS Mornings. Mm -hmm. uh, the e-commerce company is knocking. Yeah. And it was... Uh, skill set applicable that they would come to me to do this work mm. but it was also because she knew of what i had just gone through and she yeah. said this might fit out timely for you to be able to get that kind of regulated income i mean you know i'm an independent who sort of chooses less around the grid of commercial tv i kind of choose what i do special projects sure but i needed something regular yeah, yeah. and that is what the the blessing of networking and relationships were for me in yeah. this moment yeah because there was someone who could sort of speak to me pragmatically because they're the company needed me right but she also knew i needed the money so patrick one of the things that we uh we ourselves have struggled with and we see um, it from stories that people have shared with us is this whole idea of financial fronting or the kind of putting on airs and how did how does that play has that played into your story? Well, you know the the, the propaganda is I'm going to come back better and I am, but a lot of people internalize that more as you're going to get chandeliers and you're going to get uh, this and that and the other all of these extra things that that sort of pour back into expenditures and not just sort of this reevaluation of, of a life that I'm grateful for in its simplicity. Right. And so for me, I did a lot of um, making my own choices for what I wanted to build back in, because keep in mind, I did my own shopping for materials. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there might be my best friend, well-intentioned, who's saying, aren't you going to get this like me? Or you're going to get that? And I didn't want to play that keeping up with the Joneses game. Right. For me now, whereas that may have lived, it lives in the ether. We're queer. Yeah. Yeah, Come right. on. It's in the we ether. All we need to be fabulous, that, right? Where that may live, I really did some work to reprogram myself to not let those kinds of things be my concern. Yeah. It's more important that I be back safe and sound. I didn't need the biggest textile or the biggest this, that, or the other to have it work. Right. Um, Bob's Discount Furniture does just what it needs to do. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and so for me, I, I, I feel I'm, you know, am I kinder and gentler? Am I more humble? Am I less superficial? Maybe. Maybe for this moment and for what has happened to me, maybe I am. Yeah. Yes. So it's almost like you had a realization that all the stuff wasn't necessarily as important as it might have seemed at one time. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And the stuff that was priceless, like my album collections, the artwork, you know, I can start rebuilding a, a record collection yeah. um, one album at a time. But bottom line, those things are gone. I'm still here. Yeah. My memories are here. The book is written. Yeah. So, you know, all of those things that really count... I think um, my my dad lived long enough to know that I was getting back into place. Yeah. And, you know, those kinds of things are what are important to me now, more so than the chandelier.
You also leaned into, on the inspiration of some important women in your life who I think are sitting in the Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Do you mind Published that? author. <laughs> yes. COVID didn't kill it. That's what prison <laughs> for on the women who inspired me. And this is part memoir, part entertainment diary. I've always loved the divas. Mm -hmm. Diana Ross is my favorite, and my partner loves Janet. And, and we love all of them. Tracy Ellis Ross, Halle Berry, um, Dionne Warwick, um, Aretha Franklin. And I so happened in all my love for them as a child to attract a career where I've either interviewed them, produced them, promoted them, worked with them. Some of them are even my friends. Yeah, right. And so, uh, and many of them I was able to lean on during this hard time. So um, this book continues to attract great um, speaking engagements. I just did something with the School of the New York Times yesterday because nice. of this book. So this book has been a blessing to me as well, and it sort of keeps me relevant and vibrant in the marketplace. Thank you, Patrick, for such a great interview. I think that last part to me was really eye-opening. I think that one of the things that really impressed upon me was this idea that I think it's important for us to, to maybe think about our finances in a very strategic way, and maybe even think about how we think about paying our bills. Yeah, you know, we've been advocating for people to do an annual spending analysis for years, right? To make sure that your spending's in line with what your goals are. And maybe now, based on what Patrick is, has told us, we should start to advocate for people to also prioritize their expenses, right? Maybe into three different buckets, like a must pay, a should pay, and then negotiate to pay. Right. And then if we fall into hard times, then we kind of know what the priorities are, and we know exactly the lenders or creditors that we should call to say, hey, Falling on some hard times, can we negotiate something until I get back on my feet? Yeah. So thank you for joining us. Until next time, stay, stay fabulous. fabulous. This content was not intended to be financial advice and should not be used as a substitute for professional financial services.